So, hey, folks, welcome back to the Change Physician Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Kukaro, and I'm joined with my co-host, the wonderful Dr. Melissa Cady, and our returning guest, Dr. Peter Lehman. And as you may remember from our previous episode, Dr. Lehman is a family physician who has opened up his own direct primary care practice in the Seattle area, has had some fantastic success with that, transitioned and, and transformed how he delivers medicine. And he's come back to give us some insights on what it's like to start direct primary care practice as an experienced clinician. So Peter, great to have you back on the show and thanks you for coming in today. Thanks guys, looking forward to it. All right, so we gave a little bit of background, but would you kind of summarize just if we have a new listener, you know, your background in medicine, what you used to do and what you're doing now? Sure. So I'm a 57 year old family physician. I uh, graduated medical school in 1990 and um, did a three-year residency in family medicine and then was an army doc for three years. I used the military to get me through medical school. So uh, army doc for three years, got to experience sort of uh, managed care in a way. And then I joined a private practice in um, June of 1996. And that was a multi-specialty group, uh, maybe a third uh, primary care doctors and then two thirds specialists. And when I joined, there was probably 30 to 35 doctors by the end of the 20 years, I think we we're up to about 70 physicians. And I was a physician owner, so I was a shareholder. Um, every physician in the group owned one share. And um, it went from a kind of a small, kind of mom and pop sort of practice to by the end, um, which would have been end of 2015, beginning 2016, it was a it was a corporation. It was a it was a fee for service, third party reimbursement practice for sure. Uh, with a model, unfortunately, that was sort of what we might call churn and burn, mm -hmm. which most docs probably understand. So um, I started getting pretty burnt out on medicine, um, probably around 2008, 9, 10. And that was when medical records came in electronically and ended up being kind of a big burden for all of us in, in, uh, in medicine. And um, I started thinking for a couple of years, something has got to change. I got to have something else to do because I'm middle-aged. I keep want to, I want to keep practicing medicine, but it was just killing me. The routine was killing me. The shortened time with patients was really killing me. Um, just professionally, it wasn't satisfying. And so I learned about this uh, practice option called direct primary care, probably in 2014, sometime around there. And I spent about a year and a half to two years researching it and figuring out if it was something I could do. And January of 2016, I opened Vintage Direct Primary Care, left my uh, practice, my safe practice of 20 years, and went out on my own. And I've had, um, well, now it's uh, four and three quarters years since I opened, going strong in direct primary care. Very happy that I made that, made that switch. Fantastic. So how was that transition out as far as who you left, the circumstances, and then trying to start it new. Yeah. So um, I talked with my patients quite a bit about this before I ever talked to anybody in my group. <laughs> um, and really, though, it was, uh, gosh, six to 12 months. I just started talking with patients uh, about the concept of, doesn't this seem kind of silly that we're doing, I'm doing primary care for you, being paid by this third party. And I was thinking about it in, the, in terms of insurance, the way we use it elsewhere in our life. And I, I mean, it's true that it just seemed odd that we were using insurance to pay for things that were kind of inexpensive. Um, and that if we didn't have the insurance part uh, in our interactions, it would free up a whole bunch of time for me because a lot of what we have to do in our daily practice is to sort of satisfy insurance billing spend a lot of time on documenting and it really cuts into the time that we get to spend with patients. So I just started talking to patients and said, you know, this seems kind of odd and it seems like it's a, it's maybe at the root of a lot of the problem in primary care. And wouldn't it be great if there was a way that I could take care of you outside of insurance and could really devote all my time or most of my time to just actually providing care. And I had heard about direct primary care. So I sort of, brought up the idea with patients that look, you know, I'm thinking about doing a practice that's kind of like a, a gym membership or a Netflix subscription or something where you pay a set amount and then you can access me as you need to. And um, 
I could really free up a tremendous amount of time and I could be all the things you might want me to be as a physician. So I, I just got positive feedback, positive feedback. Like I actually kind of asked patients to sort of pick it apart and see, you know, what seemed realistic, not realistic about it. And patients uniformly said, wow, this is great. Like if you did this, like I'd absolutely follow you. This is a great thing. Mm-hmm. So I felt like a, a sense of confidence that it would be something I could do. Mm-hmm. And um, so I did a tremendous amount of learning myself and we could talk about that. But I, I spent a lot of time really before I ever brought it up outside of patient uh, conversations, learning everything I could so that if I told my partners that I was thinking of leaving, going out on my own, that I was pretty pretty solid, pretty confident that I I had a plan in place and that I had something that I thought would work. Uh, because with most partnerships, you know, you, leaving means leaving. It doesn't mean leaving and then things didn't work out so well and you come back. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think actually, you know, it's, my experience is based on um, a number of physicians in a 70 physician group. I saw doctors leave um, for a variety of reasons, sometimes, you know, unhappy with the situation, sometimes just wanting to do something different. And um, I think as a rule, it's difficult when a physician leaves a practice. Um, there's a strong sense of uh, turf and turf battles. Uh, most physicians, whether they're in a private practice as a shareholder, or whether they're in a practice where they're an employed physician, most physicians have signed a contract that they're really not going to try to take their patients with them when they move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's a significant issue for a physician who's established if you're thinking of leaving. So that was something I had to figure out what I was gonna do because I really wasn't interested in geographically moving substantially away from where I was practicing at the time. And can we dive into that a little bit more? Because I, I do think as a, well, even any physician who signed a contract and any con- physician who has a contract that has a non-compete clause in it, which unless you're in California, I think they're illegal, but if you're in a, if any other state is going to have some variant of that, I can see where that would be a concern because they may have heard, hey, this is a great model, but now they feel like they're trapped in a practice. They don't want to move, you know, 40 miles away, 50 miles away or whatever. So how then did you, did you navigate that? And particularly as a, as a physician owner, how did you nav- navigate that, uh, that minefield with, with your group? Uh, complete transparent honesty. Oh, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. You could do that. Wow. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> how'd that go? Yeah. How'd that go? So, uh, somebody wise said, uh, uh, always speak the truth or at least don't lie. So I went with always speak the truth. Um, I do think it carries weight to do that Mm -hmm. because a lot of times in business, people aren't necessarily fully truthful. Mm -hmm. So in my case, and I really presented it to my partners a couple of different ways, sort of a significant part that I haven't said about my decision to go into direct primary care, besides wanting to have more time with patients was that Indirect primary care, you can have a successful practice with fewer patients than you might in fee-for-service. And I was diagnosed uh, about 15 years ago with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, something I had not had any problems with until I reached about age 40. And so I saw my physical stamina really going at a time when I was, um, you know, emotionally stressed about the practice of medicine. Um, So I did two things. I went to my partners and I said, look, I'm getting burned out and I just can't see continuing to do this. I'm not going to be a productive member of the practice. I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to be a great person to be around. I mean, this is really actually affecting how I'm living day by day. And I see uh, an an out for me that I think is going to work for me. And a lot of my partners didn't know anything about my medical illness. And I said, I've got muscular dystrophy and it's beginning to take a toll. So I've learned about direct primary care. And for me, this is going to be the way that I can continue to practice medicine. Um, It's going to allow me to slow down some. It's going to allow me to kind of practice the way I wanted to all along. And 
I'm really asking for kind of human to human kindness and decency, I would hope, and that I've been a, a good partner for 20 years. I've really put the practice number one, and I've always um, done everything I could to help everybody in the group. And I did capitalize too on, on um, one of the things that I'd spent time on, which was as we transitioned to an electronic medical record system, I actually became the physician who was responsible for making that happen, which was a huge undertaking over the course of several years. And so I re reminded my partners of that contribution. Um, and I also gave them lots of warning. Like my contract required six months notification and I gave them about 15 months. Mm -hmm. And so I said, look, I'm letting you know way ahead of time. And when I leave, I want everything to be like squared away. You'll have time if you want to bring somebody in to take my practice. It just so happened, I think it was around the time that ICD-9 was converting to ICD-10. So I said, I'm going to stay here and make sure that we get everything smoothly transitioned to ICD-10. And my request is that you let me out of my non-compete so that I can practice in the area. Um, and I asked that they let me tell my patients what I was doing because what I was doing wasn't really a direct threat to the financial well-being of the clinic. Because I was talking about a very small number of patients and a completely different uh, business model and that it wasn't really likely to hurt my clinic, the, the overall clinic after I left and that I didn't have any desire to do that and I wanted everybody to be to be winners in it. Hmm. And um, I made a presentation to our board of directors and they said, thank you. You know, we really appreciate your candid candidness. We'll get back to you. And I got a call a couple days later that they said, well, for the first time in this 50 year history of the company, we're letting a physician out of your non-compete. You can tell patients what you're doing. And if it doesn't work out for you, you can always come back. Wow. So, you know, uh, being, a, being a good partner, being a good person, being upright, forthright, honest about what I was doing, why I was doing it, that I had the best interests of everybody involved. It worked out great. Um, you know, if they had said, look, we wish you all the best, but, you know, we have to maintain the standard of the non-compete, I would have had to think about what I was going to do to either buy time until the non-compete ran out. Um, you know, picking up side jobs or whatnot with a plan to stay where I was, or just think about setting my practice up outside the non-compete area. So mm -hmm. I feel like I was maybe lucky, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but um, compared to stories I've heard, whether it's moving to direct primary care or to another practice, sometimes it can get a little nasty between the physician leaving and, and the remainder of the group because you know, the, the group depends upon finances coming in a certain way. So there's certainly concern that somebody's an established doc, they leave and patients want to follow them. Well, it's, yeah. that, uh, it's when I, obviously, I, <laughs> I was laughing when you said direct and honesty because I'm not going to pull it in here, but I have my own experiences with a non-compete that have uh, uh, tainted my views on these interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I'm, I'm, there's a number of things though that I've heard you say that what I what I really appreciate. One, the whole you plant, you know, dig your well before you're thirsty kind of thing. So you were in this group, you worked well with your group, you weren't sabotaging in any way. You weren't necessarily difficult. You may not have been satisfied, but you weren't a difficult physician, and you really tried to work with them. So there was already you'd, you'd build some uh, uh, goodwill on that. The second. With, I, was your the radical honesty in the time frame? Because I think some of us in a lot of ways would want to not tell people and we'd want to wait to the last minute sort of delaying it, trying to kind of make us feel better. But, but really in many scenarios, even in more potentially in more malignant ones, it makes more sense to be open up front because at least you're crossing that bridge, you're getting it out in the open. And, and rather than delaying a decision, you're, you're providing them the opportunity to work with you. So I, I, I just think that's brilliant. And I think a lot of people may not may not have even thought about doing 15 months in advance because six months and it would seem like a lot 15 but really from a practice if you're looking at recruiting and trying to fill your position etc um you know so that's that's a, a wonderful time frame and then the third thing i was thinking about was as you know you're in a multi-specialty group 
And when you're now moving into a direct care practice and you're doing direct care, did you have any discussion about where patients that may need to see a specialist would go? Did they, or did they even open that up about talking about uh, potential referrals from you for, for the specialists in the group as a, as a direct care doc? Yeah, it never came up in discussions. Um, I, mean, I, I said I was kind of like I was lucky. There wasn't, I, I, I'm sure, well, if I had maybe wanted to, to sweeten the deal or whatnot to sort of say explicitly up front that, hey, I don't expect my referral patterns to change at all. So um, I'm going to, you know, maintain sort of a continuity with the group in that way. That's a, a, that's a, a good idea, I think you know, unless you actually weren't going to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, yes, I had a lot of good relationships that, you know, were going to continue. And my, they probably realized because I'd been there a long time and it was a cordial relationship that that would continue. But that would be something just to sort of allay the anxieties on their end. Because, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a group practice, you know, you, any threat to income you know, is concerning, unfortunately. And uh, so realizing, yes, that the majority of the revenue for a multi-specialty group is ancillary services and, and specialty fees that the primary care doctors kind of feed into that. Um, that is one more way to sort of assuage concerns and allow for a, a um, an easier exit. Yeah, I was just thinking of how, um... I love your approach and I really prefer that. Um, I've kind of taken on that mindset that, you know, anything that anyone else in the public is going to know about me, I'm not going to try to create this facade and uh, be upfront as what seems reasonable. But I think I love, I love the fact you're just trying to be a fair human being and right. you present it in a way that's very clear to them that that's what you're trying to be expecting that in return. Right. But I think there's also maybe there's something to say about who you chose to work with, despite the non-compete policy, that the people you're around, the, 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 the type of people and the kind of relationship you had, had an impact on how they responded to your request, being that they yeah. respected you as a clinician or um, your honesty and that you have a a um, track record of that. Right, right. Um, so I, I think that that's just, you know, phenomenal. I guess through that time frame that you gave yourself and them to make that transition, what were some of the ducks that you put in a row, so to speak, to start that process so that others that want to do it too know? Sure. Well, I would say, so by the time I gave my 15 month notice, I had done a lot of research. And like that, I was thinking about today, knowing we were gonna do our podcast, like, well, what, what does somebody need to know about starting a direct primary care practice? And for me, learning as much as I possibly could about what direct primary care was, you know, who's done it, you know, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, what resources were out there. Um, it's sort of like anything in medicine, like we tend to feel better if we have studied up. You know, we all unfortunately uh, encounter situations in medicine where they didn't actually teach us everything we need to know. It's like, oh, shoot, I actually don't know what to do here. But I wanted to sort of get as many uh, concerns out of the way so that when I did say, look, this is what I'm doing. I was kind of hit the ground running. So I had spent probably at least six months or so educating myself. And I could tell you what I did, um, you know, and that would have been six years or so ago, six, seven years ago. And I do keep in touch with the direct primary care community and probably could give you an idea of maybe how I might do things a little different now. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, I had mentioned in the first podcast we did that I found out about direct primary care, you know, really just sort of was just uh, serendipity. I heard a little five minute CME from a doc who was doing direct primary care, just kind of the nuts and bolts really quick of, hey, this is a membership practice. 
your overhead is gone, you've set up automatic billing like cable, TV, or cell phones, and it's not that complicated to have a small office space, either with a um, uh, medical assistant or not, and you have a very simple practice, and um, you can be successful at it. So I heard five minutes, I said, oh, this, is, this sounds great. This is actually like too good to be true. It, it makes sense. So I started tracking down anybody who I could find on the internet who had DPC experience. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, it seemed to me like there were maybe like three or four people I could really get in touch with who had been doing it for like three, four, five years. And I really just honestly Google searched. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more now, a lot mm -hmm. more resources now. But so I, I found two or three people and I actually called them up and said, hey, or email said, would you talk with me? So I spent an hour or two with these different people, just kind of hearing what their experience was. And then um, there was very little to read. I mean, it was person to person interactions. Um, I ended up after listening to pod, a few podcasts and interviews and then talking with other docs, I said, okay, I think I've got a basic idea of like the building blocks of how this would work. Um, but I was lucky that the American Academy of Family Physicians had taken an interest in direct primary care. And I found out that they had started a once yearly meeting in the summer called the DPC Summit. So I was really happy that they were, even though you know the Academy of Family Physicians is geared towards third party reimbursement, they said, hey, we're interested in helping docs find out about this and really was networking as much as anything else. So I attended a conference um, maybe the summer before I gave this um, notification of leaving to my group. And it was fantastic. I think it was like a two day summit and it was really uh, three or four docs who had done this and had gone through it, kind of laying out all the things that they had done to get where they were. And it was a super great conference. I've subsequently attended a number of them hmm. and everybody's happy. It's like, uh, you go to a medical conference where everybody's like excited to be there. and. <laughs> Everybody's excited during the breaks and nobody really wants to leave and go out and do anything else. Um, and since then, there's, I'd say, been a couple of other groups that have put together pre-COVID, at least yearly meetings where you've got three, 400, 500 docs that are interested in doing this, um, which I would absolutely do. Yeah. So for me, I, I'd kind of written in my notes here. Number one was educate. Um, and the educate for me I could maybe give you when we're done some links that you could put into the show notes. Sure. But I listened to uh, a lot of radio interviews. At the time, there were a couple of docs who were interviewing like anybody who was anybody in direct primary care. And I just listened to as many interviews as I could. Everything from docs who went to like a concierge model where they were really aiming towards, you know, under a hundred patients and having a pretty high retainer to docs that were interested in what you might call like a micro practice, where a doc might rent, you know, 400 square feet of office space, lease it from another doc, have a very small practice, small number of patients, but this affordable monthly fee with very little overhead, no support staff, really the sort of the gamut. So listening to all of that and then attending one meeting for me was enough to feel like I knew what I was doing. And then all I needed really was some support along the way as I made different decisions. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Facebook had a growing direct primary care doc group. And at the time, I think it was maybe three or 400 doctors. And that was doctors who either were doing direct primary care or were contemplating it. And so this sort of community was organically developing with docs who were happy to help each other out because you know they wanted to help people getting out and um, help the movement and that group now is probably 2500 physicians and it includes physicians residents um, some medical students as well that was super helpful to me because again you don't want to reinvent the wheel right so knowing how people had done things before was very very helpful if I was doing it now, I would definitely um, look up anything I could find, YouTube videos, um, podcasts, 
a couple of docs I know have written books essentially geared towards physicians on how to go from thinking about direct primary care to putting the steps in place to make it happen. Um, and I could let you know those and again, maybe put them in the show links. Yeah. Uh, they're fantastic. When I was doing this, there really wasn't anything like that. I had to kind of put it together myself. But being able to read a couple of books from docs who started from the ground up and did this, and then um, attending a conference, which I'm sure once COVID moves a little further down the road, we'll all get back to, to medical conferences. It means a lot to have people you know that you can call for support. Sure. It just reminds me of just this idea of, you talk about educating yourself, um, the, co the competence confidence loop that occurs, the more you build the education and, the, and feel more competent, you start building the confidence. But you know, from what you're talking about, the support from community, it seems imperative to kind of maintain that loop of that competence and confidence um, so you actually put it into action versus just mulling over it and contemplating maybe not doing it. So right. um, I think those are really powerful, powerful messages. Kevin? Oh, I mean, Peter, you look like you wanted to say something yeah. there. So yes, uh, and I think like going from this education to having some support and then actually you need to, you need to write a plan out like I actually had to learn how to write out a business plan. You know, I went on the Small Business Administration's website and found out, okay, well, look, if you're going to start a business, which is what you're doing, you need to put together a business plan. It makes you think about a lot of things you wouldn't have necessarily known about, you know, if you didn't have entrepreneurial experience before. And the business plan was really helpful because it forced me to really think about all the things that are, you know, you, it's, it's sort of like a medical plan. You, you have a basic assessment and then you've got things you're going to do underneath that. And so the small business plan really helped me to sort of force order onto a lot of ideas I had because you do need order, even though it's a simple business model. Yeah. So that's, if I were doing it, I would, well, I would educate myself. I would read a couple of books. I would listen to podcasts. I would go to a conference um, and engage with docs who had done this. And then I would work on putting together a business plan. Again, even running that by people that you would know who were in direct primary care to see, hey, are these the sorts of things that you've thought about? You know, or am I missing things here? Because if you don't have a game plan, Although it's straightforward, there are a lot of pieces to it. And that makes me think from a business standpoint, you're starting this model, like some of the numbers that I would think that you would want to make sure that you know, are like your break even point, like how many members do you need in order to pay your overhead, not what you're paying yourself, but simply mm -hmm. what facilities that you're going to have, what services you're going to offer and things like that, um, which would seem obvious, but sometimes, you know, um, like what you're saying is it's forcing you to think through the process and to confront the things that maybe our brains, we all have special things that we like to think about and we have things that we don't like to think about. And what that plan makes you think about is the things that you like plus the things that you don't like to think about right. so that you can identify them up front. Um, that all being said, could you, could you just describe, like if you describe the gamut, there's a micro practice, just a physician, small number of patients all the way up to a concierge level, which again, a small number of patients, but a completely different level of care uh, in, in payment model involved. Where, where is your clinic in the spectrum? So if, if you have, what's the basic model that you're using? So I would say mine is just sort of a, a traditional direct primary care practice. So by that, I mean um, five to 600 patients. It's probably pretty typical, somewhere between 500 and 700 patients. Um, a monthly fee that covers any clinical care that I provide. So that could be a traditional office visit. It could be a virtual visit, Zoom, like we're doing now. Um, it could be a house call. It could be a phone call. It could be a text message. So any professional services that I'm going to provide to a patient are included in that monthly fee. And the monthly fee is, you know, I would think we would call it affordable. Now, everybody's got a different idea of what's affordable, but I think most direct primary care practices 
on average, if you look at different age groups, probably about $75 a month thereabouts for comprehensive primary care. And then as far as the model beyond that, most doctors try to provide extra value on top of that if they can. And I talked about some of those in our prior uh, interview where um, we take advantage of things like physicians being able to dispense medications in the office and offering that as a value to patients because we can purchase medications wholesale and dispense them in the office, save the patient going to the pharmacy and paying a marked up price for the medication. Um, most direct primary care clinics also find a local lab that they can establish a relationship with so that they can get cash price labs at a big discount for their patients. Um, so that's my model, which is as many things as I can put into the monthly fee, we do. Um, and, you know, it, there are things like EKGs and pulmonary function testing, things that we do in primary care that have a little bit of expense for the doctor on the front end, like an EKG machine or something along those lines, but they're not that high. And we've thrown all of that into the bundle of the, the primary care membership. And then we've, like most primary care clinics that do this, look for any other opportunities to save people money because, you know, the reason that we're doing direct primary care is to offer like a more intense level of care, which is a time component, but then also affordable care because we want patients to get both while we're at the same time being satisfied with the, the job that we have. So most of the doctors I know who direct, who have chosen direct primary care have kind of gone with this model. Um, I know a small number who've gone and done concierge, but they're looking at maybe like the top 1%. You know, I mean, they're really aiming at a particular market, whereas this is kind of across the board. And then I know a few doctors who went to the micro practice route where they might work three days a week and might have a couple hundred patients. But with that as well, just to kind of provide some context on there, because one of the fears may be I'm going to go out and start this practice. Would you mind kind of detailing your, the physical space that you have or you utilize as well as any staff that you have? Because both of those would be overhead concerns for somebody who perhaps may be starting off and whether they're, are you going to do micro practice where you may have less space and not have to be concerned about paying somebody else's salary versus, versus something right. else? So that, idea you brought up of the break-even number of patients was really important. Um, you know, you, you have to, it's, it's challenging because you do not know how many patients are going to sign up with you. <laughs> you just don't. Even leaving a 20-year established practice with five-star Google reviews and whatnot, um, I had about 220 patients come with me that's like maybe 10% of my practice, even though I had three or four times that many people said, oh, as soon as you let me know it's, it's open, I'm going. So, oh, shoot, not as many. But I already knew that my break even was like maybe 150 or so. So I knew that even though I wasn't gonna make much money, I was, I was gonna be okay from the get go. And so looking at that, um, what I think most doctors should do is they should do a couple things. One is they should say, well, how many patients would I feel comfortable taking care of, you know, knowing that I'm not comfortable with the status quo of 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, whatever it happens to be. Like, what do I think would be a number of patients that I think I could be happy with? And the way I looked at that is I, I looked at data that showed how often do most patients access healthcare on any given day. And it's probably about 1%, 1 or 2% of patients want to get some sort of care per day. So if you have 500 patients, you're talking about five to 10 patients who might think about coming into the office for some reason. And I knew that I did not want to see more than 10 patients a day. So I kind of had an idea like five or 600 patients was going to be roughly what I wanted. So you think about, well, how many patients am I going to have? Add up all the expenses that you can think about, and that's going to be part of that learning process and learning from others to say, okay, I've got, I've got lease, I've got insurance, I've got, you know, whatever I have to cover. And then how much money do I want to make? 
you know, so if you know I need a certain amount of revenue coming in minus the expenses to net out what, you know, my salary to be, you can pretty much then figure out what the monthly membership needs to be, assuming you charge everybody the same amount. So, you know, if you just took ballpark figures and said, oh, I've got 500 patients and, um, you know, I, let's say you want to make $200,000 a year. Well, if you're estimated that your uh, expenses are going to be about 100000 a year, you need to have $300,000 in revenue coming in, which means you need um, $1,000 of revenue. Well, not that much. 60, I think. 600 times 500. So you need $600 a year per patient to get that revenue. So it's like 600 divided by 12 is $50 a month. So that's sort of the simple like calculations that you would want to do to figure out doing what you um, want to accomplish. For me, I ended up taking about 1,200 square feet um, of lease. And that allowed me two exam rooms, a front desk, a front waiting room area, which in retrospect should be really small because people never wait. They just kind of get whisked right through to their exam room. Uh, but it allowed that, a procedure room, my office, um, and then in, uh, a bathroom realistically probably could have gotten away with eight or 900 square feet. But it was, it's just looking at too, what is this, what does it cost to lease the space? Absolutely positively, we're always working to keep the overhead low, 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 low. And the biggest components of overhead are your lease and whether you have staff. I ended up deciding to have a medical assistant from day one because I knew before I started, I was gonna be in the black yeah, not in the red. And so I wanted to have, I figured that level of patients, I would need some help. But I know quite a few direct primary care doctors who started out with very small numbers of patients and they didn't have staff because they didn't need it. And with a plan that as they got busier, they would add staff coming in. So yes, you absolutely positively have to think about, did you, do you want to have staff? Do you think you're going to have enough um, patients coming in on the front end to to cover that. And there's that challenge of it's a new market and we don't know, you don't know what your business is going to be like. I planned for the worst from the beginning, which was, I didn't say what if no patients followed me because I had been around a long time, but I said, what if only 50 patients came? Um, and I made all my projections based on that. Um, and that was good because it's sort of like if you plan for the worst, then everything is happy surprises. <laughs> That's awesome. So in doing that, you know, it brings up other questions like, oh, am I going to be willing to work something on the side if I've got 50 patients and I, you know, only need one patient who needs something per day? Am I going to work less hours and, you know, find some side jobs to support the income while the practice get, is building up? Um, in my case, I had no interest in doing that. And I felt like since I'd been in practice for a long time, as I was making the plans, I felt, oh, I think this is going to work out. And then I really had sort of these commitments from patients who were going to come with me. And I pared those down. I mean, I, I did cut down the number of people who said they would come. I think I think said like 30% of that just to, to plan for that and turned out to work out pretty well. Yeah. Um, but your overhead goes down a tremendous amount. If you're just in a practice and you have no idea like what it costs to run a practice, like you're an employed doc, most practices are probably spending 50, 55% of their uh, revenue is already eaten up with expenses. But if you can make your, your, your lease footprint small and you either have uh, no staff or minimal staff, it's really easy to get your costs down quite a bit. And the office definitely does not need to be more than what we would call like a dyad, like two people. Like a traditional office from the old days of a nurse and a physician, plenty of staff. You don't need anything more than that. You don't need a receptionist. You don't need other people to do things because you've got a team that can get everything done. Hmm. So it sounds like you broke even that first year from what you said that you yeah, had. I broke even day one. I mean, yeah. I don't want to you know, people have to realize there's all kinds of experiences. Sure. I do know people who have struggled and who 
have had to take side jobs working, you know, moonlighting and whatnot, because, you know, the, the numbers didn't come in so quickly. But, you know, we're talking about my transitioning an established practice. Um, it might be interesting for you down the road to find somebody who started a practice from scratch, you know, out of residency or, um, well, probably out of residency, I would assume. So, um, yeah, I was lucky. Although it wasn't luck because I'd spent 20 years building up a reputation. And so I had patients who wanted to stay with me. So yeah, it so, always helps to be a good doctor. <laughs> no, it's, they it helped you on a lot of fronts. I mean, that, yes. that's phenomenal. So that first year, going from your first year to now, does your practice look any different? Has it evolved in any different way other than more patients? Yeah. Um, not really. Um, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do with the practice. And for me, that was uh, long visits for patients who wanted long visits. Like that was number one. And anything else besides that was just going to be, you know, peripheral aspects of the practice. So I was able to achieve that and was totally in control of that because I can limit how many people I have. And, and actually, I think I'm at 550, 575, somewhere in that range. Like, I just sort of know if I go beyond that, I'm going to be eating into this availability to have the time. So that hasn't changed. And I knew that I wanted to have time to sort of bring back some of the skills I had had to give up uh, for my prior, prior practice. So skin biopsies and suturing lacerations and doing joint injections, things that I just sort of pawned off on our specialist before. I knew I wanted to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been able to do that. And I think the only difference is that the practice is, you know, the patients are five years older, but I really thought very carefully about like what I wanted my day to be like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all the things I envisioned doing. And so I had a real clear idea. And I know other doctors who've had very different practices. Um, they were fine with shorter appointments and they really wanted to be like heavily procedure oriented. Like they wanted to do a ton of dermatology or docs who wanted to really focus just on the elderly so that they could spend more time for, you know, home visits or palliative care or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I've been happy. It really has turned out the way I wanted but if I wanted to gradually move another direction, I would. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say probably as I get older, I'll, I'll let a lot of the procedures probably go by the wayside and spend really like all my time in face-to-face -face with patients. Awesome. Well, it's, it's, it sounds, um, it, it, you know, we've had these discussions about direct primary care in the past, but I, I think what's really attractive to this model to physicians who the majority, you know, we go into medicine because we want to help people get better. And this, this new practice model, which is sort of the old practice model that we're just kind of reintroducing again, right. provides uh, really control of your time, which I think is important, controls how you, uh, provides a sense of control over how you practice. And from what you're saying is very flexible because now you can then adjust your practice. Uh, granted, if you're in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody, there's a very small population. Well, I guess you can control that you're living in that situation. That's probably <laughs> you're there is you like that small population, right. but you can, you, know, you can, you can kind of target what you were, you were saying if you're more procedurally oriented versus if you're more in a geriatric focus or, or what your interest may be, this model seems to really align with that quite, quite well. So. I know a uh, family physician on the East Coast, the practice is entirely home visits. That's it. It's all home visits. There's no office. So the overhead is really low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but it's the same, it's the same idea. It's a monthly yeah. membership. And things that are membership based, there's no quote billing. I mean, th there's software now that, you know, can automate all of the billing and you just get notified if something doesn't come through, you know, pro a payment doesn't go through and the software has tried a couple of times to get the patient to, you know, update their data. So this idea of like a, an easy recurring monthly inflow that you don't have to spend much time on, then it really is, as long as your patients are happy with the service you're providing, they'll stay and you 
you know, you, you do what you want to do and you're going to attract people that like what you do. You know, not everybody is, there's docs who would not want to have a home based practice, but for this gal, like it's, you know, she's happy every day that she gets up and gets to go see people in their homes. <laughs> and she couldn't do that any other way. So the cool thing is, is that you can make it however you want. And you just need to have, I guess, a certain amount of faith, as long as you're not way off the reservation, that there are people who will be attracted to what you're offering, especially if you're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And if you provide people this, the kind of service that they do not get in the regular system, people will stay when they know that they are like the most important part of the system and that you're truly a service industry now, like you're there like any other service, like you have to keep your clientele, which means providing them stellar service that they rave about. Um, then if it's something that you love doing and you've set it up to be what you want to do, I mean, that just is gonna follow through in how you interact with your patients. And, and this may not, based on, on how you started and, and kind of your, your unique launch plat pad, uh, have, have leveraged being a, a physician for long periods of time and having really good relationships. Right. Um, but for other specialties, or even including yours, when you're trying to grow initially, marketing becomes an issue. Like how how did you get in front of people and an awareness of your practice? Did you find that was a challenge? And if so, what did you do? And if if it wasn't a challenge, what have you done to um, what did you do to grow your practice? Was it all word of mouth or something else? Yeah, it remains a challenge. My practice is full, like I'm not taking any patients and I haven't really taken any significant number of patients for a while, which is a nice testament to the fact that the you know, patient population is pretty stable. Um, but I did think about marketing a lot from the beginning and about two and a half years into this practice, I was approached by a physician assistant who wanted to set up a direct primary care clinic in a town about 10 miles away from here that would be an extension of my clinic. And um, there were a variety of reasons why we did it. Um, sometimes I wish I hadn't because it's nice just having one office. Anyway, we, that was a practice that was starting from scratch. So we thought a lot about marketing for that practice and spent a lot more money marketing for that practice. And everybody I know in direct primary care told me don't spend money on marketing. <laughs> don't, don't uh, you know, think about spending a lot on newspaper advertising or getting on the radio or holding town halls or this or that because it's going to be word of mouth. And after having spent marketing money on Facebook, uh, newspapers, a little bit of radio, uh, sponsoring events and the like, I would say don't spend money on marketing. <laughs> it really, I mean, it is word of mouth, I do think, and it's word of mouth by your patients. And I ask my patients to talk about the practice. If they really like it, would they talk to their friends about it? Or would they post on Facebook? In fact, at one point, um, Early on, what I would do is at the end of the visit, I said, hey, this was a really great visit for me. What did you think? It's like, would you just take a quick uh, maybe selfie with me? And you could say, you could tag, you know, you're at Vintage Direct Primary Care and say, I just had an awesome visit with Dr. Lehman. I mean, something really simple like that. We did that for a while, but um, I think then I got busy and I didn't need it any longer. But like creative things like that, where it doesn't cost any money, those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. But I do think like most medical practices grow by word of mouth, like you get a reputation. Yeah. And I think direct primary care is the same. It always helps too. I, I would say good word of mouth from like nurses at the hospital. Like even if you don't take care of patients in the hospital, um, you know, going and being nice to nurses and thanking them for the care they're giving to your patients when they're in the hospital and whatnot. It's always good to have good relationships everywhere and for people to know what you do in the, in the service industry. Yeah. So yeah, I, marketing, I don't think traditional marketing works very well. And so that's something I would 
I would resist the temptation to do it because it is a cost. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would want to add on to that, I think, is a lot of the marketing that we're exposed to as physicians, particularly what traditional practices have done, uh, for a for a new company or a new uh, you know and for particularly for a new practice, I, I completely agree with you. It, it just kind of throwing up these things and hoping and praying that somebody's you know pay a bunch of money and someone will happily take your money while you're doing that. Oh yeah. Um, but there, it, yeah, it doesn't. It, it is not the way to market a new practice with this kind of thinking that you're Coca Cola and, and not you can't can't put up a Coke ad for your direct primary care practice and think that that's going to give you patients. Well, and it. I said it sort of remains a struggle for for me. I'm surprised that so I live in a community that's about 10,000 people, but it's contiguous with a county that probably has a couple hundred thousand residents in it. And yet I've been in practice for five years and I have very positive word of mouth saying with our second clinic, the number of people who still have no clue what we do. It's just huge. And trying to figure out how to make just this idea something that people don't immediately blow a intellectual gasket on and say, oh my God, like, I have no idea what that is, or dismiss direct primary care out of hand because someone maybe has insurance or one of these sorts of things. It's been a challenge. It's nice to be on podcasts because that helps. And, you know, hopefully with more time, the idea of a direct primary care clinic, a DPC clinic, people say, oh, yeah, I know somebody who's in one of those. Because it's very hard when you're doing something that is just very different. Yeah. Right. From the status quo for people to even pay attention to it. And I don't really know the answer to that other than time passing. And then any chance I have when it comes up in conversation, I tell people, like in a, a minute, you know, what I do, even if it's at the grocery store and somebody just happens to be talking to me. I think it's sometimes when the pain of the status quo becomes too immense that people start seeking other answers. <laughs> and that's why it takes a while for people to start, you know, moving in the other direction. Yeah. Um, I think that plays into your time um, calculation right. there. Well, I think that's oh. true. And it seems to me like we're getting close to like a tipping point mm -hmm. in you know sort of traditional um, delivery of care in medicine. Yeah, I think people, I think patients have been unhappy with it for a pretty long time, and it's sort of like I don't know the the, the old uh, movie where the guy says I um, I've had it I can't take it anymore in the newscaster. Uh, pe people are beginning to say like I can't take it anymore because they've, they've taken it for a long time. They've just sort of said, oh, well, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, but it, there's definitely, it's an obstacle. Like if I was going into direct primary care now, I would definitely go into it with my eyes wide open that there's a lot of educating to do. Mm -hmm. Even fellow physicians mm -hmm. who have no idea what I do and think it's something that it's not. Yes. It's so simple. It's like, look, pay me a monthly fee and I'll provide all your primary care. It, it's, it's not that complicated, but people start <laughs> thinking it's this sort of odd, crazy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now you got my mind racing, Peter. I'm like, yes. oh, you know, what, what sort of marketing approaches would work and what, to, you know, what models to apply and uh, all sorts of fascinating things probably for another episode, but um, you know, I just, I thank you. I, I really appreciate your, your journey in discussing, you know, your perspectives, particularly as an experienced physician, because like I, like we had said, uh, I think before we started this recording is, you know, it, your brain will always offer excuses on why not to do something. And so I can see the new physician saying, well, I can't do this because I'm not an established physician. They have it so easy to start those practice yeah. while the established physician is like, oh, I wish I was a new grad because they don't have to necessarily worry about non-competes and, you know, making my partner satisfied. Those new grads have it so easy. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed your perspectives on um, how it's a challenge for whoever you are, but it is a doable yeah. challenge. Well, and by doing that research on the front end, you'll figure out like, it, you'll get excited about it or you won't. If you're excited about it, 
you don't look at the obstacles. We look at them differently. They're just like, you know, things to be checked off as opposed to, well, I think I might want to do this. Like, mm, you know, you, if you're excited, all these things can happen because it is, there's no losers. That, that goes maybe is a good place to end it, but there, there's no losers in this. Patients win, physicians win, uh, laboratory companies win, radiology comp you know, corporations that want to discount studies for cash win, uh, wholesale distributors of medications win, insurance companies win because they, they're not having to deal with claims for things that are honestly probably not worth the cost of payment. So if you're excited about it and you've got a, you know, a decent entrepreneurial spirit, you know, it, it is a no brainer, even though you have to be tenacious in any small business and you can't rest on your laurels either. I mean, I'm four and a half years in and I'm always kind of thinking, oh yeah, I should really think about how did I set that phone system up four years ago that's just sort of been running, you know, no problems. And maybe I should go back and just kind of think periodically about what am I going to do if. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Kevin, any any uh, other questions? Um, I think we 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 attacked a lot of the ones we wanted to. In fact, he brought up a lot of the answers before we even said the question. So <laughs> <laughs> we could do several hours on this, especially I know. To <laughs> Kevin's ideas on marketing and yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do another episode on that because uh, yeah, I, I do think there are some unique opportunities, particularly for direct, direct care when it comes to marketing. And, uh, and as you know, I'm super excited about the model and I, 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 I love it to watch physicians like you who are taking control of their practices and lives, finding a way to return to this idea of, well, how do you be a good physician without all this other junk? And, and, and most importantly, where we're not sitting there thinking, oh, woe is me, I can't believe I went into medicine. Like, this is a privilege. There's, this is a, a wonderful thing. This is wonderful knowledge that we have. Um, and so how can we think differently and how do we apply it in such ways that, like you said, it's a win-win, win-win for you, win for you, win for your patients, win, win for everybody. And we need more win-wins when it comes to medicine. Yeah. I sure do. I think, I think this speaks to the fact that if we can just collaborate together, it's more of a win-win. And right. I think I think you're a perfect example uh, for those listening out there that just being a fair um, physician who's trying to be transparent and be honest and mm -hmm. and and really serve the the person we're trying to serve, which is the patient. Right. That ev every party, whether it's an ex employer or our partner, um, everyone wins if we if we just come to the table with the right thing in mind, and that is to serve the patient uh, with transparency, honesty, and giving them the best deal and the best value for their money and uh, really looking out for their best interests. So I just want to thank you again for joining us on the Change Physician podcast. And for those listening, I am Dr. Melissa Cady with my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode and make sure to check out thechangephysician.com and join us in our community there. Take care. <laughs>